this past Thursday, March 17th, a little after 7 a.m., I caught a train up to New York to attend a meeting with the General Board of Global Ministries in which I serve as one of the directors. And the General Board of Global Ministries is our mission arm of the United Methodist Church. And on the ride up, there was a man sitting in the seat in front of me. He got a phone call on his cell. And I could hear his conversation. First, let me say I was not eavesdropping. I was not eavesdropping on him. For one, we were in the quiet car on the train, right? You know what the quiet car is on the, on the Amtrak train, right? There are signs that hang down from the ceiling that say no cell phone use and no loud talking. So the car was quiet. Nobody was talking until this man's telephone rang. And the man started talking on the phone. So everyone around him could hear his conversation. You know what he said on the phone? Here's what he said. Whoever was on the other end of the phone, he told them, you are to meet us in New York. There is nothing like being in New York City on St. Patrick's Day, so, starting with the parade. It was Thursday, remember? Thursday on the train. Starting with that parade, you need to meet us in New York City because there's nothing like it. The parade is awesome. And he went on and on, and finally he hung up. When we pulled into New York Penn Station, I went up the escalator and out on the street to 33rd and Broadway, and all I could see was people in green. People, men dressed as leprechauns, walking around, people wearing green hats and shirts, green balloons hanging all around, all over the place. When I got in the cab to take the cab uptown to our meeting, the cab driver said, well, I can't go that way because the streets are closed. Fifth Avenue is closed and 34th is closed and 32nd is closed. All of them are closed because of the parade. Lots of people dressed in green, excited, happy, flocking in the streets. The parade was coming. There was so much excitement floating around the town when Jesus mounted that cult. Life in Palestine had been difficult for a whole lot of people. There, there were no happy days, no good times. And there, there weren't even, they weren't even in an election season. The downtrodden, the lost, the lonely, and all of those who had been left out, the rejected of society, had very little to look forward to. Life was hard, and life was difficult. It was hard, and it was difficult. There were few who benefited from having Rome in charge, but only those who were willing to break their vow with God and become criminals, on the other hand, were able to make a living that day. It seemed like the city was in the haves and the have-nots. To be honest, Jesus of Nazareth was a spark of excitement for the people. He was a breath of fresh air. He showed us an example of how to live in the worst of times and make it in the best of times. Mm -hmm. He came from a barn, but he lived his life as if he came from a palace. He was happy. He was happy. He was happy. He was dedicated to who he was, and he was disciplined in what he did. Disciplined in what he did. Huh? We've been going through the season of Lent, living the spiritual disciplines that God asked us to be a part of, that we're a part of. Huh? The discipl spiritual disciplines of prayer and fasting and reading and teaching. Huh? I'm telling you, the Daniel fast, it is over. Praise be to God. It took discipline to create different eating habits and stick with it. It took discipline to redirect our time and our thoughts that would be so focused around food and eating and turn that time into prayer and devotion. Whenever people encountered Jesus, they found hope. Because here was a man, here was a man, now get this, here was a man who was able to be happy without having anything. Huh? Oh, y'all didn't get that. Y'all didn't get that. He was able to make the best of times out of the worst of times. Huh? Look at somebody and tell them I'm still trying. 
right, right? But there was something about him. What amazed me is that he gave these people hope. He gave them hope, right, Deb, right? He gave them hope. He didn't give them hope in the Roman system. He didn't tell them that Rome was going to take care of them. No, Jesus came, comes along instead, my sisters and brothers, and he tells them that they need the hope that Moses talked about, that the Lord himself will fight for you, that when your back is up against the wall, the Lord will be at your side. And he introduced into their lives a God who is more than just the subject of rituals. Somebody you come to church to praise and worship, but the God who will be with you Monday through Saturday and then meet you in church on Sunday. Oh, my God, on Monday through Friday will come to rescue me, rescue me. It will come to my workplace and my job and rescue me. He will come where the enemies are surrounding me and rescue me. He says, I want to introduce you to a God who is more than somebody who is just there on Sunday morning, but a God who comes with power. Huh? Did you know that you didn't have to come, that you don't just meet God on Sunday morning? Huh? I know, I hope that's why some of you come to church on Sunday, right? Not to meet God, but to praise God and to thank God and to celebrate God. But you know that God can also come. Monday through Saturday. Did you know that? Right, right? When he got up on the back of that cult that day and began his ride into the city, everybody everywhere started saying the Messiah is here, the one who is going to get rid of the Roman Empire, the one who is going to throw the oppressor off of our backs. All of that is going to be over in the twinkling of an eye for Jesus the Messiah is on his way to the city and he is going to get rid of everything that stands in our way. The kingdom of God has finally come. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. People got up and they started lying in the streets. Huh? An impromptu procession began, a one-man, one-donkey parade. The Savior is on the back of a colt riding into town. The people are breaking off the palm branches and waving them in the air. Others are laying cloak and garments in the road. There's no parade permit given for this. In fact, the people in leadership are so nervous that the Romans are going to take a threatening stance toward them and, and they say to Jesus, tell your people to shut up, tell the crowd to be quiet. There's no permit for this parade. We can't be acting like this, going out here and shouting and screaming. And Jesus said, I'd like to tell them to shut up. I really would, but I got news for you. If these people here hold their peace, then the rocks, the rocks will pick up where they left off. Mm, help me somebody, come on. Why? Because when people start anticipating what God is going to do in their lives, you can't shut them up, even if you want to. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen. Thank you, front row. Amen. And I think, there are, I think there are about 10 people in here this morning who had some moments of anticipation of what God was going to do in your life. If you weren't shouting, the car was shouting, the street was shouting, your bed was shouting, the television was shouting, somebody could shut you, couldn't shut you up, somebody could shut you up. But the eggs and the bacon in the, in the frying pan started shouting, right? The toast would jump out of the toaster and, and, and praise his name. That pot of oatmeal would scream hallelujah. The refrigerator door would swing open and the leftovers from last night would start hollering hallelujah, come on somebody. Somebody ought to hear me this morning. The dishwasher would start right, rising, rinsing, and, and saying, thanks be unto God. The furnace would let out a groan and say, ain't nobody like Jesus. Your washer and dryer would start spinning and saying, bless his holy name. Oh, how many of you know that, huh? If you shut up, then everything else is going to pick up where you left off. An impromptu parade starts. There's a parade with the Savior riding on the colt. And the parade, a Savior on a, on a colt. But he's headed to the city, coming to Jerusalem. And there is no doubt that he is the Messiah, that he is the Christ. He is the Messiah, the anointed one who's coming with the anointing. 
He is anointed by God and he's on his way to the city and the people are singing hallelujah, better days are ahead. All that's behind us, the kingdom is coming now. And they started hollering, hallelujah, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Yes, Hosanna in the highest. And the Savior is riding on his way into town. But in his mind is this word as he makes his ride to the city. Oh, it's coming. But not yet. Look at somebody and say, not yet. In other words, these people are about to have a major big-time disappointment. Hmm? Wait, y'all still haven't gotten it, huh? God is about to let them down, to fool them, to let them down. Uh Uh-oh, he's on his way to town. He's on his way to the city, but he's got to go through another whole week. And then there's Friday. He's going to be nailed to the cross. There's going to be the exact opposite of their expectation. They're looking for it now. Now. God is going to work stuff out. N-O-W. Now. 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 Look at the person next to you. Say, that's how we think. That's how we think. They are ready for it now. Now. And to their expectation, Jesus' reply is not yet. Not yet. Let me just break it down for a moment. Because there are some people in this sanctuary who can identify with this. Who are standing in the shoes of of those people in our text. Who are about to be or, or have been disappointed by God been fooled by God. And I I know you don't want to say it, but nudge somebody next to you and tell them, he fooled me. He fooled me. Come on, it's quiet in here now, right? But I wonder if there's anybody in here this morning who had some moments when you thought, he fooled me. He fooled me. I thought it was going to work out right now. I thought everything was going to be in place now. I prayed and I sowed my seed. You saw the dirt? And I thought God was acting on my behalf now. I thought when that door opened and I, and I got that job, that that was a job, but he fooled me. Huh? I thought when our relationship had a good night, a good evening, a good afternoon, that, that we were about to turn a major corner, but not yet. I thought my children had finally waken up to come to their senses. They were making some positive steps, but he fooled me. Not yet. Not yet. I wonder if I'm talking to anybody here this morning. Anybody who lived through, I thought it was now. But it's... Come on, if you live through it, just wave your hand. You don't have to say God fool. Just just nudge somebody. I live through this. I live through this. You fooled me, God. Thought it was now. It's coming. But not yet. Not yet. There were others in the Bible who were called fools, right? Consider Abraham's willingness to follow God's command to sacrifice Isaac, his only son born to Sarah when she was 90 years old. Abraham obeyed God, taking Isaac to a mountain and offering him as a burnt offering. Fool, Abraham, you're a fool, some would say. But God had a plan. Sacrificing Isaac was only a test, a test of Abraham's obedience to God. Seeing Abraham's willingness to submit, God told him not to harm Isaac. With these words, God blessed Abraham. I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. God had a plan. Or consider the story of Ruth. The Moabite who left her family and homeland to travel with her mother-in-law to a foreign country. Uh, Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. You fool. Ruth, you're a fool, some would say. 
But God had a plan. Ruth would marry Boaz and, and God would bless their marriage with a son who became the father of Jesse, the father of David. Often Jesus was referred to as the son of David. God had a plan. Or consider the young virgin from Nazareth who one day found herself expecting a baby. An unwed mother in those days would not only bring disgrace upon her family, but upon her fiancé as well. Town folk who, who would mock her and shun her, she would become an outcast. Many such thoughts have flashed through Mary's mind when she became pregnant. Instead of running away, Mary listened to the angel's message. You fool. Mary, you are a fool, some would say, but God had a plan. God sent an angel to Joseph in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. God had a plan. Or consider the motley crew of men who left their homes and their families and their jobs and, and their friends to follow an itinerant preacher who had no resources to offer signing bonuses, benefits, or traveling expenses. Fools, you guys are really fools, some would say. But God had a plan. From this diverse gang of followers who disappointed Jesus, denied ever knowing him, and disbelieved that he had risen from the dead, came a faith so strong that an institution was established that has lasted over 2,000 years, the church of Jesus Christ. God had a plan. Today, some 2,000 years later, huh? God has a plan for you and for me. 2,000 years ago, Jesus sent his disciples to go and to borrow a colt that was tied up. And Jesus got on the back of that colt and rode into Jerusalem. People waved palm branches. People laid their cloaks in the road and they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Huh? You see, you thought my riding into town marked that everything is over. No, that's not the case. My ride says that everything is just beginning. Mm, everything is just beginning. I invite you, my sisters and brothers, to come back on Thursday night and Friday night and come early on Sunday morning to hear the rest of God's plan. To hear God's plan of salvation for you and for me, to hear how God turned the world upside down. God has a plan for you and for me, even today, as we wait. Not yet. Come back for the rest of the plan. I wonder if there's anybody here today, anyone here, who is searching for God's plan for you and for your life. God is the answer. And God has a way just for you. Just for you and for your life. For people like you and me, sinners as we are, God has a plan for our lives.